live from New York. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube. Covering Rapid Miner Wisdom 2016. Brought to you by Rapid Miner. Now, your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Hi, everybody. We're back to wrap up. Rapid Miner Wisdom 16. We're here in New York City. Day-long event. Uh, actually started yesterday, you know, last night. The place was crawling with data scientists, Jeff. <laughs> um, good event. You know, a lot of good thought leading, you know, conversations. Clearly, this industry, whatever we want to call it, big data, predictive analytics, machine learning, uh, you know, Hadoop, et cetera, evolving you know, beyond the sort of tire kicking phase. We, we well beyond that. I think we were beyond that last year. Really into the, okay, how do I get more value out of this? We know this is an imperative. Um, you know, Rapid Miner, I mean, as a company, fresh injection, I think it was 16 million. 16, in, yeah, in cash from Nokia number. Ventures. Uh, so that's key. I think that's, I think that's really important because funding is drying up. You know, B rounds are getting very difficult. You talk to you guys out in the West Coast, Furrier has his nose to the ground on this stuff, and it's very clearly the sentiment is changing. People are nervous, obviously you see that in the, the stock market. So having, you know, a fresh injection of cash obviously is important because now you can focus on the, on the business. Uh, new leadership in, in Peter Lee, uh, Ingo, you know, visionary leader. So, you know, good story. A big install base, I think, you know, obviously what the challenge, of course, that Rapid Miner and companies like that with that open core face is how do you translate that in, and convert that into, into paid and add enough value to do that. So version seven is clearly designed to help that expand you know, the platform and expand the, expand the monetization model. I mean, that's the, that's the big question is when the dust settles, who's going to be you know, standing, making money with a, with a viable business model, right? You got, you know, these guys are more, I would say, Cloudera-like than they are Hortonworks like, and that Hortonworks is selling just the subscription to the maintenance. Cloudera has an open core and then sells value modules on top of that. That's really precisely what Rapid Miner's doing. You know, the, the former model, the Hortonworks model, is predicated on massive volume. You know, they're in it right. for the long right. game. The Cloudera model, you know, you're seeing their private company, they obviously have a lot more cash, you know, from their private uh, investments can stay a little bit longer. You're, you're seeing companies, as we've talked about many years in theCUBE, staying private longer, not having to go public. You know, it's tough being a public company, right? Especially now, Hortonworks just had to do another raise. They beat revenue, but they had to do another raise. Had to raise 100 million. We, you know, we saw that coming. George Gilbert predicted that, and so it was pretty obvious. But, you know, they're in the game. Now they have fresh cash. It's going to be really interesting, Jeff, when the dust settles to see who's standing and you know these guys got a good strong community a core to build from what's your take i couldn't help but think of michael dell over the last couple of weeks as the stock markets had uh, mm -hmm. a rough entry into 2016 and him smiling like the like the the cat with the canary going private and you know not being exposed to this <laughs> right. the kind of whipsaw and, and massive uh, changes in in valuation i think what's it what's interesting is this pursuit of the citizen data scientist you know how do you get the data science out of the hallowed halls of the the big brain PhDs, how do you get it down to the analysts? How do you really drive, as I think uh, Paul talked about, building a culture of analytics? And that's where I'm really curious to know, where are the entry points? Who are the people? What is the function? What is the application where you can start to move, you know, kind of mid-tier decision makers into uh, data-driven decision making? Or they can really start to, 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 to pull that in. I, th I thought the, the marketing example was interesting because you start to hear a lot of that in marketing. We don't cover a lot of pure marketing events, but you know, marketing is one of these scientists that's really moving now because they have the data um, to more of a data-driven execution as opposed to you know, the classic marketing. You know, 50% of my marketing budget is wasted. The only problem is I don't know which 50% it is. So I, I think that pursuit of the data-driven um, citizen uh, data scientist is really important and I think that's really going to define it because that's the only way you're going to really grow your TAM. That's the way you're going to really bring a lot more people into this, into this portfolio, a lot more people using the applications. And then the other thing that will be interesting to see how it sorts out is, is the ecosystems and the continuing shifting sands in the ecosystems. Clearly you have to have an ecosystem whether you jump on one like at AWS or pick your favorite big vendor that pulls along you know, the wave, or you can create your own. I don't think RapidMiner's big enough to really create their own. Maybe they can around the open source piece of it, 
but ecosystems are so important in plugging into a system of other applications, providers. It's interesting, Peter said they have no delivery capability. You know, they, that right now they depend 100% on their partners. So that's goodness in that it's a clear value proposition for somebody like PwC. Um, and if they're here, obviously, they wouldn't be here if they didn't see the opportunity to build a really big practice. But um, to me, that's it, Dave. How do we get out of the, da the data scientists? How do we get out of, you know, kind of the unfulfilled promise of, of traditional BI, which I think people love to still put that in a bucket and get more data-driven decision making uh, broader into the company? So, um, we've been on this theme, you know, for a while now of, of systems of, of intelligence, expanding on Jeffrey Moore's concept. And, and in our world, it's really, when we talk to our practitioners, it's all about bringing analytic and transaction uh, systems together, leveraging the systems of record and ex evolving those into systems of intelligence, not creating separate bespoke systems of insight, really bringing those two worlds together. And speaking to George Gilbert, some of the things that he's going to be focused on is helping practitioners look, think about machine learning in the context of focusing on both business outcomes, but at the same time improving their analytics capabilities. And they're, they're complementary, but you don't have the resources to do all of them. So how, based on your, your business requirements, can you, can you sort those out? So how do you prioritize projects? You know, should you look at the business impact? And how do you assess the technical capabilities and the risks associated with that? Um, lot, still a lot of customization in predictive analytics and machine learning. You know, how can we move toward and leverage more commercial off-the-shelf software, clearly rapid miners trying to create that, that platform, but still a lot of customization going on. And how do you protect your IP if you're bringing in outside consultants? You talked about PwC here, world-class consultant. <clears throat> you know, how do you deal with that? Do you, can you deal with that contractually? I mean, you have to be you know, very careful um, with when you bring in professional services for that customization. How do you protect your IP? You know, the people skills, we heard from uh, David Weissman today, the organizational models, centralized versus distributed, hybrid with a lean towards centralized. You know, George talking about helping customers sort of sort through that with frameworks you know, that allow us to sort of better understand what the right fit is for your particular situation. So that's where a lot of the research is going to be focused this coming year. Obviously, the Cube plays a big part of that. We're expanding our networks. The Cube you know, alumni network is a huge part of that. We did 77 shows last year. We're kicking off this year, obviously, in our you know, big data wheelhouse. Uh, we've got, I think, six big data events planned this year. We've got Spark Summit East. We'll probably do Spark Summit West. We've got the, the big data SV and NYC that right. we do every year. That's four. Then we've got Hadoop Summit in San Jose. We're doing Hadoop Summit in Dublin, which I think is in April. So that's at least six big data shows independent of the other ones where we go, it's a, you know, it's a, where it's a, a vendor show, like a Splunk, for example, right. uh, or a Tableau, hopefully those guys will you know, have us back. So, so lots of focus on, on, on big data, obviously infrastructure, you know, our tradition, Stu's doing the Gillette Stadium today, the VTUG, you know, the core, VMware audience, obviously Oracle you know, is infrastructure and apps, the service now shows, uh, and of course cloud. Big, big cloud emphasis. We do reInvent e every year, as well as other cloud shows. We got IBM Interconnect coming up, which is right, a big cloud right. show. So talk a little bit about sort of your plans for theCUBE in 2016. So we're going to continue to do what we've done, and we're going to try to do more. So as you said, we're going to continue our real big presence in, in big data. We're going to really continue to go in cloud. I think we're going to pick up a couple of new AWS shows we're talking about, potentially in Chicago. I don't know, Dave, we've ever done a show in Chicago with no, theCUBE. Um, AWS Summit is going to be there. You know, they have their regional shows. We've done San Francisco for a number of years. AWS Summit, I think we might do New York this year. Um, and then the other opportunity is, is that we're looking at is a in continued global reach, uh, we just came back from HPE Discover uh, in London not too long ago, you mentioned Dublin, there's some other opportunities we're working on that we have not closed yet, keep an eye on siliconangle.tv, and then we'll continue our application focus as well. Um, we're, we're, we're starting to see this, you know, I see big data as kind of this infrastructure layer thing, and I think eventually we're not going to talk about big data as big data, it's an enabler, now we start to move to the applications. And the ones that are coming up next that we haven't really covered per se specifically is Internet of Things. Um, and Internet of Things uh, is defined by what's going on in automotive, what's going on in wearables, what's going on in uh, sports. There's a lot of now applications that have been enabled by you know, computing power on tap, cloud, this really crazy 
uh, connectivity that we're seeing now on, on, on the wireless space and the applications that are going in over the top of that. The other thing, you know, we were at the, uh, the Ford launch of their innovation center in Palo Alto. We'll actually be talking to Ford shortly and, and we've talked to GM. You know, what's fascinating is the whole transformation in the automotive industry around um, thinking about the whole experience, not about car ownership. That car ownership is a piece of your transportation experience that's probably multimodal. You may take a car sometimes, you may take a bike sometimes, you may take the bus sometimes, you may take the train sometimes. And the fact that somebody like Ford recognizes the importance of changing the way that they look at transportation is pretty significant. We talked to GE uh, in the context of the Predix Cloud for Internet of Things, which is going to be coming down the the pike. Bill Rue and team, I think he's got almost a thousand people in San Ramon, which is not an easy place to hire in the Bay Area, but really talking to them about even within the jet engine group, they're thinking about the entire experience from the time you leave your house to the time you arrive at your destination. Oh, by the way, there's an airplane in the middle there that's using a, jet, a GE engine to get you there. But the whole Predix cloud and what, what General Electric is doing, I think we're really going to see this, this huge push on IoT. The other thing that I think is really, it's fun, similar, is, is the virtual reality and seeing more and more applications. Uh, we, we did an interview with Spacetime Insight where they're using a combination of virtual reality with like a heads up display and internet of things in power grids and power stations so you can look at a piece of equipment and it tells you it's running hot, it's running cold, it needs maintenance, this one's fine, hey pay attention over here. So I think that's another uh, area that we're going to see. It's Again, it's a combination of these other technologies coming together and it's big data and it's cloud, but now I think we'll see a lot more in the application layer and really ways people are transforming their business and, and I'm really excited about some of those opportunities. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up about IoT. So George Gilbert's been doing a lot of work there too with, along with David Floyer, um, talking to Ingo off camera and, and basically there's, there's the piece of, you know, the humans are the last mile narrative and that's certainly true for m much of the predictive analytics, but a lot of it is going to be machines talking to machines and, Predictive analytics fits in there as well. When's the you know wind mill going to break? I don't want to have to do a truck roll every time to figure out, you know, when that windmill is going to break. And Furry and I talked a lot about this at HPE Discover, and and basically, of course, you want to instrument the things, but the things better be connected if you're going to instrument them, because you know otherwise, the data is going to be out there in an island, and then of course, what data actually comes back? Right, right, right. So a lot of really interesting issues that we're we're working on and helping our communities understand. So. So we're a wrap. Thanks very much for kicking off the year with yeah, me thanks here. Thanks for coming down to New York, York once yeah, again. Pleasure for coming out. And uh, gents, Greg, Patrick, Leonard, nice job. Bert, you know, back on the, on the crowd chat land and all the team uh, with Kristen Nicole and the writers. So thank you guys for watching and thanks for Rapid Miner for having us here. So that's a wrap. This is theCUBE. Um, let's see, what's next for us? What is Spark Summit? Spark Summit East. Spark Summit East. Coming back weeks, in uh, uh, yeah, Manhattan. Right, Mid Feb, right? Mid-Feb yep. back in uh, Manhattan, so look for that. And uh, as always, thanks for watching everybody, and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.